So this is how do you really do GPL enforcement, also known as bringing software right to repair to the masses. So first, a little about me. I'm Denver Gingrich. This is my website. I am the Director of Compliance at Software Freedom Conservancy. And I also work on JMP, which gives people phone number freedom and is all free software. I'm also OSS guy on all the things like Wikipedia, GitLab, and many others. So first, why are we here? Why are we at FOSSI? Uh, why do we care about all of these things? Well, we're here for freedom, the freedom to repair, modify, and update our device, and particularly the software on that device. And the reason that's important is because uh, there is an increasing amount of intelligence and control um, that happens uh, inside the software that is in our devices. Um, so it's important that we be able to control that so that our devices can uh, obey us and can help us in the ways that we want. Now, I want to uh, mention this quote here. This is um, something uh, that we sent to um, someone, a company we were trying to work with um, to get source code after many, many iterations. Um, and they had um, gone to their web, gone to the websites of some projects they used and uh, copied the source code from those websites and sent that to us. Um, and, and this is um, a thing that we wrote back to them. Um, and so uh, the, the real point here that we're trying to make is that um, GPL is not, is not a make work license. It's, it's not just so you can do some things to check some boxes. Uh, the point is to give people freedom uh, the freedom to install modified versions, that is, to make the device help them in the ways that they want. Uh, and in particular, uh, the GPL requires, and I'll come back, back to these words, the scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable, uh, which you may have heard in previous talks today. Um, so I'm going to be coming back to this, uh, but this is really the thing that uh, I wanted to focus a lot on here. Um, and this is a quote from GPL version 2, uh, which is uh, the license that we see most commonly violated, uh, mostly because uh, Linux is used in uh, the vast majority of devices uh, with any amount of software that you buy today, uh, like refrigerators and clothes washing machines and TVs and routers and all that sort of thing. So to back up a little bit, how did we get here? Uh, how is it that uh, we need to get all of this code and that it isn't just coming automatically to us? Uh, well, that used to be the way it was. Uh, there was collaboration by default um, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, people shared source code with each other um, and they shared software with each other. There was really no reason to not share the source code along with the software. Um, and during uh, most of that time, there was not even a notion that software was copyrightable at all. So people would uh, just share software. Uh, they would share the source code for that software, and it was all very natural to them. Um, and so that is how it all started. Things started uh, with software freedom, and that was the default. Uh, but then, um, starting around the 80s, uh, things started to change. So uh, people may be familiar with a certain printer story uh, from a notable individual. Um, where this person was trying to fix an issue uh, with their printer. Uh, and so they thought, well, of course, the way I've been doing it for, uh, for years, I'll just go ask the company for the source code for the printer um, and then go fix the problem myself. Uh, no problem. So they went and asked the company, hey, could you give me the source code? And the company said no. And, and, and they said, well, please, I would like the source code. And they said no. Um, and so many other people around that time had similar experiences. Um, and so uh, some people got, got together and they said, let's fix that. Uh, let's make sure that we can keep getting this collaboration that we've already had for all of these years because it's something we don't want to lose. Uh, we don't like the way that this is going. Uh, we think that software should continue to be shared um, and we want to do something about that. So there are different solutions for different layers of the stack. Uh, this was at the software layer. Um, and so uh, the thing that was worked on at that time uh, were some uh, software agreements, um, such as the GPLs, 
Um, and that was one way to get uh, those rights, those software rights to people through the, these agreements. Now, there are a lot of other people working at different layers of the stack, for example, um, uh, with hardware. Uh, there are a lot of excellent right to repair movements, um, and they work primarily through legislation um, in different states and countries. Uh, and so uh, it's great to see all of this work together uh, combined so that people can have uh, control over their devices, both at the hardware and the software level. So with all of this, now that we have these software agreements that give us uh, the right to modify our devices so that they can help us do what we want, um, what, what is kind of the, the first step in that? Uh, so where do we start with all of that? Uh, so generally, when you uh, receive a device and it contains software licensed under uh, the GPL, uh, which is one type of copyleft agreement, um, there are there are two main options for how a company uh, or the person distributing the device to you uh, can comply with the license. So one of them is to provide you the source code along with the device. Um, so this is an example um, on the left here. Um, this is a CD containing source code. Now this uh, CD does not exactly have source code from a device. I'm using it more as a, an example of uh, a CD that says source code on it. Um, this is probably some pretty interesting source code uh, from from Usenet in the um, in the eighties. Um, I wonder I wonder if you could still get that. Actually, I think this might be on Internet Archive, so it's all there uh, for you if you want it. Um, or you could uh, provide it on a USB stick if you prefer. So um, this is a USB stick from Ours Vault that has uh, their GPL source code on it. So this is one way to comply. Um, you can provide the source code on a durable physical medium like one of these along with the product. And I say this is the easy way to comply because uh, once you've delivered it, your obligations are done. You don't need to keep anything else around. Um, uh, if you deliver the source code with the device, then your obligations cease. And so uh, in that sense, it is easy to comply. So there's a second option, and this is the option that be has become uh, much more popular, uh, but is harder to comply with. Um, for reasons I'll get into shortly, and that is to provide an offer for source code along with the device instead. Um, so this is an offer for source code from Sony for one of their TVs. And then here's an offer for source code uh, from, um, this is one's from Samsung, I believe, and this is for um, a clothes washing machine. Um, yep, they're getting smarter or, you know, depending on your opinion um, uh, about things, uh, maybe something else. Um, and then this is uh, an offer for source on the right here uh, from LG for a refrigerator, um, also getting smarter or, or something. Um, so uh, this is the common way that you will find uh, companies uh, attempting to comply with the GPL at kind of the front end, you could say, um, the first thing that the user might see. So these are all snippets um, from manuals from these companies um, that you can find online. These were actually used um, as part of a uh, part of a submission we made um, to the government when they wanted comments on uh, the energy guide um, and how to update that. Uh, sure, yeah, I can take a quick question uh, midway. So, uh, so the question was regarding uh, the, the topmost offer for source here, um, noting that it just links to a website and doesn't provide a way to send in um, a, like payment for uh, sending of a physical medium. Um, now, I, these were not presented as like the, the best examples I've ever seen of offers for source code. Um, just something that companies have attempted to use to comply. Um, I would recommend uh, still including that option as well to people. Uh, that is what uh, we recommend, um, particularly because people may not have uh, may not have access to the internet, and so it's 
it's best to provide an option so that so that you're not uh, in any way uh, a non-compliant um, to ensure that people have that option. Um, so I will move along uh, onto the next step here, which is uh, once we have this offer for source or we've looked at the CD. Um, it, now, what we often find, and probably what you're interested in hearing a little bit about, uh, is that th there are some issues along the way. And so um, there can be a variety of issues, which I'll get into a, in a moment, uh, but I'm gonna uh, tell you kind of what it looks like from Software Freedom Conservancy's side. So what we get a lot of are reports of GPL violations. Um, we receive those uh, when people email us at compliance at sfconservancy.org. Um, we get a lot of violation reports there, uh, which is not to say you should not send us more. We would like to know what is going on um, in the industry generally. So please let us know if you're aware of any GPL violations uh, by emailing this address. Um, and I will take a look at it. Um, that's one of the things that I do. Um, and uh, then we will move on from there. Um, so notably, we receive so many reports here. Uh, that there's there's seldom a need for us to you know look elsewhere to see where G GPL violations might be happening since uh, you could say we're kind of inundated. Um, so we hope that that will change over time, uh, but right now uh, that is uh, the main way that we uh, are made aware of different GPL violations. So after we receive the report, we triage that re report. So we check to see. We confirm that um, binaries under the GPL, that is non-source code forms of the work, were, um, were distributed. And then we check if any source code or offer for source code uh, was provided along with that distribution of the binaries. So if we have received an offer for source code, then we check that offer. Uh, that is, we uh, send a message to the company saying, could you please send us the source code? And in the case of no offer for source code or source code, then we contact the company because in that case, a GPL violation has already occurred. Uh, and usually when we contact the company, they will send us um, a source code candidate. So uh, when we receive a source code candidate, either from contacting the company indicating the violation or from checking that offer, then we do what we call a complete corresponding source or CCS, sorry, check. Um, and uh, that is the thing that we want to, to determine uh, if it's complete and corresponding. Now, we often find that when we do this check, that the source code is not complete and corresponding. Uh, maybe it doesn't compile, uh, maybe it doesn't install all of these different things. And so we often have to go back to the company and say, hey, I tried to compile it, it didn't work. Here's the error I got, could you fix it? And they send it back to us. Um, and then it gets past that error and has another error a few lines down. Um, and then we have to do that uh, often many, many times, uh, sometimes a dozen or more, uh, which is confusing to us because we wonder sometimes if they actually test the uh, source candidate before they send it to us. Um, I would posit that often they don't. Um, and so we're basically just debugging um, the, the, the stuff that uh, we had hoped that they would, would be able to do on their own. Uh, so that's why one of our general recommendations is that if you're making a source code candidate, that you provide it to someone else in the company who is not involved in creating the candidate and say, hey, can you build this? Uh, can you install it? Can you get all of those freedoms that are required by the license out of this? Uh, so that people can see kind of uh, as, as another uh, person familiar with how to do these things in general, uh, if it's possible. So sometimes after contacting them and going back and forth many times, uh, we eventually uh, find that it works. So that is wonderful. And in that case, uh, we would get it to users. Uh, we would uh, really, frankly, announce it to the world. Um, and, uh, and then we would encourage a lot of things to be done on top of that, um, as have been done uh, in many cases before. One of the uh, excellent examples of that is OpenWRT, um, which started after um, a lawsuit against Linksys, um, where they received source code for that router um, and then made a project, which now runs on lots and lots of different routers and has uh, since then also become a member project of Software Freedom Conservancy. But sometimes that doesn't happen. We go back and forth many, many times. Um, people who were here from the previous session might know um, the timeline for, uh, for Visio, where we contacted them 
um, uh, in 2018 and then tried to work with them for three years and still didn't get the corresponding source code. And in that case, sometimes we need to file a lawsuit and that makes us sad. No one is happy when you need to file a lawsuit um, and uh, we don't want to have to do that. Uh, so we hope that people will comply without us filing a lawsuit, uh, but sometimes we have to do that um, because the company is not providing the source code after being given a lot of opportunity. So I've been talking a lot about these source candidates, how we check them and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, you may be familiar with this project. Uh, you may want to see some of this code that I've been talking about, uh, and we do indeed have this code for you. Uh, and this is available on Use the Source, uh, which is this website that we launched at FOSDEM um, earlier this year. And if you go to this website, you will see a lot of these source candidates that I'm talking about, uh, the ones that we have reviewed to see if they are complete and corresponding. And you can see a lot of the comments that we've made uh, about these source candidates um, to determine you know, what issues we ran into when we tried to um, compile them and that sort of thing. So uh, we would love if people would provide us more source candidates um, and also add comments so you can join the mailing list there um, and take a look at what the candidates are and leave comments on the candidates uh, that exist there um, and you know try compiling them and see for yourself uh, the sorts of things that we work on. I did want to briefly also highlight that Think Penguin does an excellent job of compliance and so you should definitely check out uh, the source candidate that is the complete corresponding source release that uh, we have for Think Penguin on that website. So uh, as I mentioned, try them out and then you can uh, keep listening to me if you like as well, uh, or you can poke around at that. There will be lots of time for questions at the end here so I can chat about some of your um, questions in real time if you wanted to try some of those out. Um, but yeah, feel free to keep listening as well. So let's break it down. What exactly do we do when we check these source candidates? So. What is this CCS check? And again, I'll use these words again um, since they're very important for determining what we're trying to do. Uh, we are trying to check if the source candidate contains the scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable. And therefore, we want to know, does it compile? That is, does it have the scripts used to control compilation of the executable? And secondly, does it install? That is, does it contain the scripts used to control installation of the executable? And lastly, is it the complete corresponding source? And this is quoted from a different part of GPL version 2. So first of all, does it compile? Uh, can we break that down? So first, we take a look, see if there's a readme file. This is what we would expect, a readme or similarly named text file that describes exactly how to do all of these steps. Um, that is, uh, would be the scripts used to control compilation of the executable, or at least one part of them. So if we do find that, then we take a look at that and use that to determine how to continue. If we don't, uh, which uh, we would try something like make, running the make command or other standard uh, tools that you might use to start a make process. But we do generally expect that readme, that's gonna make it much easier for people to know what's going on, what they're expected to do. So the readme may say that you need a certain operating system uh, in order to do the compilation. And so this is a question that came up earlier today. Um, and uh, generally what we're looking for here is enough specificity to know what we need to obtain in order to complete the compilation and installation. You don't have to distribute the operating system itself, uh, but you need to provide enough information so that the person can acquire it. So often, often a company will say you need this version of Debian or something like that, so that's fine. We can um, install that in a virtual machine or otherwise and then use that to do the compilation. Now, we've installed that, we put the source candidate on there, and then we ran the instructions in the readme, whether that's uh, make or whatever. So it starts compiling, wonderful. Um, and then we get a few minutes in, and um, uh, this often happens, uh, you run into an error. Now, you may be wondering when you run into an error, is this my fault? And the answer is, if you followed the instructions, 
No, it is not your fault. Definitely not your fault. It is the fault of the uh, organization who gave you these scripts because they did not give you the uh, scripts used to control compilation of the inst uh, of the executable uh, if you ran into an error uh, while following those uh, instructions uh, slash scripts. So that's very important. If you run into this, please let us know at Software Freedom Conservancy uh, so that we can try to uh, try to correct that. But sometimes you don't run into an error and then the compilation completes. And so that is the uh, source code is turned into the different executables. And then uh, the uh, executables are assembled into a firmware image, uh, which is what we would expect. Um, yes, quick question. Uh, go ahead. Well, how did the how did the company? So the question, I, I'm sorry, I don't think we have a mic. So I think, and, and please, please let me know if I need to rephrase this. Um, uh, but I, I think if I understand it correctly, the um, the question was um, regarding uh, Conservancy's position on whether uh, if these scripts don't exist, um, that they need to be created and prov oh instructions. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right, I understand, and I think what, and and I think Bradley covered this a little bit earlier, uh, in the sense that if if that is the situation, that is to say, if these scripts don't exist um, to complete the compilation of the executable, uh, that they need to be provided, like they exist in the heads of these um, of these people who are uh, completing these tasks. And so they need to be written down so other people can uh, can also complete these scripts. Um, and I think there's another comment on that. So the that the response was just because you got act, all your actors to memorize the scripts doesn't mean you don't have to uh, tell us what the script is. That would be a, a type of script is a, a script provided in human language to instruct them how to complete a task. Uh, the, the comment is that it is.
I the the just to be clear the um I I guess to sorry because this isn't being um captured on the recording so I'm just going to try to summarize what what we're discussing here um uh the uh to clarify what we're saying is if these scripts exist in someone's head that is the way that this um this source candidate is compiled is to um take some of these uh memories of what a person has of how to do uh these steps that the these need to be put into a fixed form and delivered to the user so that they can also do those steps um and then there was one comment in the room uh that said yes you would for example for provide the dot bash history um uh of the person uh when they completed these steps because that is one place where it would be um uh, where it would be available as an example um, I think there was another, um, oh, maybe a few other questions. Um, I, I'll probably, I'm going to come back to this. This seems like a very exciting po part of it, but I just want to make sure I've gotten through the, uh, the other parts first and we'll come back to it uh, then. Um, so um, to kind of jump in here, um, uh, when uh, we finished this compilation step, then what we would expect is that uh, the source code candidate um, has produced a bunch of executables, and those ex executables have been assembled into a firmware image. Um, and this is what we would expect for most classes of devices that we find uh, that we find FOSS on these days. Of course, there are devices where the uh, installation may be done in a different way, uh, but for most uh, devices, this is the way that you do installation is through a firmware image. And so that would complete the compilation part of this. Now, the second part is, does it install? So let's find that readme file again and see if it mentions anything uh, regarding install. So it may say that you need to use some sort of an update user interface. So say you have a router and may have a web interface. There may be a place to upload a firmware image. Um, and the, the readme should indicate that, uh, should indicate how you do that. Uh, or it may have a display of its own. Maybe it's a television or something like that. And you're supposed to put the uh, compiled um, firmware image onto a USB stick or something and then use some menu uh, on the TV in order to install that. That would also be um, an acceptable way if that were um, explained in this readme file. Now perhaps you do that and you find it works. That's wonderful, but we should check a few more things first. Um, so uh, perhaps you uh, change something like a version string or something else, then you um, uh, compile that firmware image and uh, flash that onto the, the device, and perhaps it still works. Uh, that's also wonderful. Um, but sometimes um, if you make a change, uh, and this is just a note I want to make because it sometimes happens, although it's rare, um, you may brick your device. Um, uh, and that is to say your device may be bricked. And I don't want to say you bricked your device um, because if this happens, it is again not your fault. It is the fault of the organization that provided you the instructions because they were not complete and corresponding uh, if you ended up breaking your device when you followed those instructions. Uh, now this again is pretty rare. If you're concerned about it, then you should ask someone else who has done a similar thing um, to see if uh, that does work or not. Um, but that is a, a danger I just wanted to mention briefly here. But um, sometimes uh, that uh, doesn't happen. It all works fine. Uh, and then we need to move on to the next step, which is to determine, is it complete and corresponding? So uh, you may have done all of this installation. It all works great. Uh, but then you wonder, well, do I actually have all of the source code uh, that I am required to receive by the licenses? So there are a few examples um, where we don't get all the source code. It's not complete and corresponding. Uh, one example would be proprietary kernel modules. Um, so uh, kernel modules of Linux are derivative of Linux. Uh, Linux is licensed under GPL version 2, and therefore the kernel modules need to be licensed under GPL version 2 as well. Um, and so that would be a problem if you received uh, kernel modules and did not receive source code for those kernel modules. Now you may wonder if there is any other non-source code stuff as well. So you should take a look through there or you know, let Conservancy know so we can take a look um, and see if there are any other things in there that may be covered by copyleft licenses for which you haven't received source code. And uh, lastly, we want to make sure that uh, the things that have been compiled are similar to the things that you received. That is, are the binaries of a similar size? Uh, do they have similar functionality? Uh, because 
Um, we don't want it to be at the case where the thing that was shipped to you is something that has all these features, but the source code is something that does not have all those features. Um, so that's another step of our process uh, where we uh, check to see if it corresponds. Now, if there are no problems with any of that, that all checks out, then that's wonderful. Uh, we get very excited as we were when we did this for the Think Penguin router, um, and then we let everyone know about it. Um, and so that's uh, the thing that you can see on Use the Source um, as an example. So, uh, so yeah, those are the things we do. Now, I mentioned a few times where the answer to uh, does it compile or does it install or does it correspond is no. Uh, and this does make us sad. So what do we do in those cases? Well, we contact the company. Um, uh, we contact them repeatedly. Uh, we contact it, them many times. Um, we try really, really hard um, to get them to provide the complete corresponding source to us. And then uh, sometimes uh, that may work, uh, but sometimes it does not. And after many months or years, um, sorry, we have to uh, file a lawsuit. And that is unfortunate. Again, it makes us sad. No one uh, wants a lawsuit, but that is uh, the option we are left with if we're not able to get source code um, through uh, nicely asking for it um, and, and uh, pleading for all of this time. So you may be wondering now, well, what can I do? Uh, what is it uh, that you can do to help with all of this? Um, to assist with this product process um, and help us get the complete corresponding source um, for a device, perhaps a device that you have that you want to do interesting things with. So one thing you can do is you can check these offers for source code. So those examples, the three examples I showed on an earlier slide, um, if you find one of those, maybe you're looking through the manual of a uh, device that you have, um, like a dishwasher or a TV or a router or something like that, and you find such text, you can go and, and check uh, to see what source code candidate they provide you when you ask for the source code that way. So I highly recommend looking through any manuals or menus of devices that you have, because often there will be a little section in the about or legal or whatever that says where you can get the source code. So you should definitely um, check that out and ask for the source code. And there's a little uh, bonus feature of uh, use the source, which I'll mention very shortly related to this as well. So then once you've received the source code candidate, then we recommend that you um, take a look at it and try to use the scripts uh, to control compilation and installation uh, to see if those work as we mentioned. Now, if you aren't sure or don't know how to do that, that's fine. You can just let us know about the source candidate um, and we are happy to check that for you. So let us know the results of what you found. Um, so upload that source candidate to use the source or um, send some comments on the mailing list, the CCS review mailing list, uh, which is also available from that, that website. Uh, we would love to find out more about uh, what you encountered when you did these steps. And now uh, onto that new thing that I was teasing earlier. Um, so there's a new feature of Use the Source that we just launched this week. And it is uh, this place where you can upload an offer for source code um, to use the source uh, itself. So uh, you can go to this link here and it is a very simple little page where you can upload any offer for source code that you find uh, because we find that sometimes people are nervous about how to ask for source code when they see this offer for source. And we don't want that to be um, an, an inhibition or, or a problem, you know, something that prevents people uh, from trying to get the source code. Uh, so if you go to that website, uh, then you can uh, take a picture with your phone or something, and then you can uh, quickly upload that to the website. Um, it should have uh, a very, uh, you know, nice uh, but simple user interface. Um, so that you can do that very easily if you have like a paper manual or something. Um, it's very easy to upload there. Um, and if you want to know the results, then please email uh, email us at compliance at sfconservancy.org. Uh, since we want to keep things, um, uh, you know, we don't collect any personally identifiable information on this uh, form. And so if you do want to know the results, you would uh, can follow up with us separately on that. Um, so yeah, please use that. Um, and uh, and this is what I wanted to say about the things that we are doing to ensure that people are able to make their devices work for them. 
uh, so that these devices can help them, that they can work for them, uh, and that we can start cool new projects like OpenWRT for different device classes uh, once we get the source code for more products out there. So you can help in all of these ways. And uh, I have a bunch of time for questions. So thank you very much. Yes. So I'll just repeat the question. Um, so uh, the question was commenting on um, Samsung and Google and others uh, potentially using iFixit or other services like that to um, kind of streamline the way that they provide parts and other repair information to people. And the question was, is use the source intended to be um, a similar thing for software? And I think if uh, companies wished to uh, upload their source candidates directly to us through Use the Source, we are happy to host them there uh, for companies if they want to. Um, and uh, yeah, we would be happy to do that. I mean, we would encourage the companies to maintain some control over the where they post the source code in case they're using the offer for source method, um, since uh, they are required to provide the uh, uh, that code for three years after the last distribution of the device under version two and longer in the case of GPL version three. Um, and so it, you know, it's probably something they should be handling um, themselves, but of course we're happy to assist uh, with use the source if they wish to do that. Uh, yes, go ahead. So the question was regarding resellers, and um, I, I guess I'll summarize it as, are there any concerns with resellers that uh, they may have lost the piece of paper or like offer for source code or something like that? And yeah, that can be a concern. Um, and uh, generally speaking, you know, the, the person, the entity distributing it to you is the one uh, who has those obligations to comply. And so I hope that people doing reselling would retain the offer for source code and that sort of thing along with the, uh, the device. Um, but, but yes, that is sometimes a, a concern. Uh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, so the question there was um, regarding uh, situations where um, where you might find some source code online and it um, and it has some issues where it only builds under certain uh, certain circumstances. For example, it needs a version of of GNU Make that is lower than a certain version, um, and that is um, that is something I'd recommend that you report to them um, so that they can correct that in general. Uh, I mean. Uh, in, in the case of a source code only distribution, your obligations are much different than if you're producing binaries to someone. Um, but, but yeah, it's generally good if the source code can be compiled. So definitely let them know.
Um, but so I'll, I'll try to summarize it. I'm not sure um, how much we could say about the, um, uh, the compliance in this case. It sounds like it's quite old. Um, so it might be beyond the three years or so um, a scenario, assuming they did provide you with an offer for source code. Um, so was there any particular concern, like any, like, were they not indicating version numbers or something? Yeah, that, that's definitely an issue. If they don't specify versions, they should be specifying that. Um, yes, Jim. So, uh, That, that wasn't a question of like, I was asking about the device, I got the new dog on it so far, but I, I think I did. And it's like it was mandated with the third company. And so my question was do I ask the speed up company or do I ask the longer name company? So, so I, I think it, just to, to answer that part quickly here, um, the the question was regarding the, the reseller situation where you're getting it from a storefront and it's unclear whether the storefront should be um, obligated to give you this or the, the, the distributor kind of, you know, on the a few levels down from the storefront um, that's actually sending the product. And the point is that you need to receive the uh, source code or an offer for the source code with the device. And so I guess your question is, um, if you don't receive that, who do you need to contact to ask about that? And I would say, um, if you're not sure, let Software Freedom Conservancy know the details, and then we can figure that out um, and contact the appropriate people. Um, and I think, so there was some other discussion that happened before that question that uh, would, would not get on the recording. And I think there was a comment that uh, was going to be made over there um, to some of that or another question. Yep. Uh, so the uh, 
uh, so the the question was in a world of perfect compliance um, uh, isn't there um, uh, some disincentive for uh, a company to use coffee lefted software sounds like okay um, and so uh, my answer to that would be um, um, would be that uh, the company is free to use uh, whichever software it likes that it has appropriately licensed and complied with the licenses um, and so maybe they don't use any open source and that's their choice um, so and you know conservancy uh, we don't enforce proprietary licenses and so if if you want to use all proprietary licenses you know we're, we're not going to be going after you um, uh, and so so that is one of the um if that's a concern you know that that's a thing companies can do and i think there have been examples of companies in the past that have thought oh well you know if we have to comply with the license then we'll go and use some other software instead um and so they've switched to an all proprietary stack um and they found that it um that it's just not flexible enough or doesn't have other features they want and so they move back to the the copy lefted software they were using before and so um, you, you know, uh, I think the, the thing a company needs to ask is, uh, you know, what, what is the benefit to us? You know, the usual questions that any, um, uh, any for-profit company would ask. Um, and I think in the world of perfect compliance, you would still have all of these wonderful things happening. Um, it's just that things would be even better, uh, in my opinion, in the market, because you would have a lot of other companies available that could uh, do the fixes and other things that are currently, through GPL violations, being locked to one specific company um, because they're refusing to let third parties reinstall onto the device, whether that third party be you, the user, or a repair shop that you hire to do that work for you. Um, and so that's something that I, I hope we can see more of as more companies are in compliance with the license. Yes. Copyrighted, copyleft software of various copyright holders who release it under a particular license. The burden of proof belongs on the vendor who is shipping this copylefted software to prove that they can do it. We lost it, but we don't know how to do it either. So the question was about where is the burden of proof? Uh, uh, that in terms of when a company is not in compliance, uh, you know, does a company have to, uh, does the company have the burden of proof to, to show that they were in compliance with the license? Um, and that to me sounds like a bit of a legal question. Um, and I, I'm not a lawyer and, uh, you know, I can't provide legal advice as a result, et cetera, all of that stuff. Um, but um, generally what I have seen, what you can see in um, public court documents um, is that there is generally a responsibility the uh, the company violating the license does have to explain um, you know the steps they've taken to resolve that um, and how they are in compliance um, and yeah that's kind of um, it, it you know if a lawsuit is filed that would be up to a court to decide any other yes so build system software and you can, they can have bugs, right? So I was wondering in your experience, how often it happens that it is not completely and correspondingly enforced because it has bugs that were not enforced by the engineers and how often it happens that actually there is no source code at all or it is partial. And I guess I know the answer, but I'm curious about your... Uh, so the question is, uh, what do we do if there are bugs in the build system that are provided to us? Uh, we We... We would love it if the worst thing that we found were bugs in build systems when we are trying to test um, source code candidates. Um, and in that case, you know, given the state we're in, you know, that that would be one of the least problematic things in terms of, you know, how close the um, it would be to compliance. And so we would have a very, um, I, I hope, um, uh, a very nice conversation and say, hey, we noticed this bug, can we fix it? And let's move on. So that's um, 
No, uh, no. Uh, when I when I say there are problems in the build system, these are not bugs in some some like build system component um, that you know were unforeseen or something. They're just simply things that are missing outright that um, that it is basically impossible to reproduce ourselves. And this is one of the things I do when I'm reviewing a source code candidate as I will try uh, a bunch of different things to see if I can get it to work. And then I'll provide patches or other things to the company and say, hey, uh, you should include this patch again. Um, and this is not anything I should be having to do. Like this is um, uh, should not be something I have to do, but it is something we try to do to get to complete corresponding sources fast as we can um so that's what we're looking for um uh, yes in the orange what? uh you mean in uh so the question was so um the question was regarding the success rate uh of conservancy in receiving complete corresponding source code uh when we asked for it um, sadly, the percentage is very low. Um, that's why I highlighted Think Penguin. Is it above zero? Uh, so that's why I highlighted the question was, is it above zero? Um, and I was going to respond. That's why we highlight Think Penguin because they're an excellent example um, of a situation where we have. <laughs> no, there are other examples. Um, for example, there is a, a keyboard that we've reviewed recently that has some embedded firmware on it and as uh, in, in our review appear to be complete and corresponding. This is a comment as a researcher. There is a selection bias here because potentially there are in the world other people that independently do from conservancy ask for corresponding source code and they obtained it and you're not seeing it. Yes, that's so just the comment was there may be a selection bias in here, which I definitely agree with. We are being um, sent uh, GPL violation reports that people want to see fixed. And that's partly why we've launched Use the Source because historically there hasn't been a way for people to share these good examples um, in you know this common place uh, where people can all look at these examples. And so we would love for people to provide these good examples uh, of source code uh, candidates as well so we can put those on there. Um, that is complete corresponding source code releases. So um, so yeah, thanks for, for mentioning that. Um, is there any other, yes. So the question was, are we putting are we putting all of these source candidates in a software heritage, uh, which is a software archiving project? Um, and right now we are not submitting them automatically to the software heritage project. But if that is something the software heritage project wish to do, then we could collaborate on that definitely. Um, uh, they, they are hosted locally on our servers. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Any other questions? Also, I am not sure regarding the timeline how close we are, and we may also be running into a coffee break here. So I'm I'm generally uh, generally happy to stick around and answer more questions if you want, but probably I, I should officially end it. Um, and so uh, so yeah, I'll be around. And um, uh, thank you all very much uh, for being here.